Okay, something's going wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, my dear friends, <clears throat> and welcome to English Mania. Today I'm going to read a story to you by Mark Twain, which is called How to Cure a Cold. So today we are going to read the story. The story, by the way, is adapted for levels B1 and B2. However, I'm sure that it will be useful for those who are only at the beginning of their studying, because you can simply see me read the story and follow the text, so to practice some pronunciation. Anyway, mostly this lesson is for B1 and B2. I'm going to read the story to you. After that, I'll ask you some questions to check your reading comprehension. And then, at the end of the lesson, I'm going to explain some interesting vocabulary to you, as well as some confusing grammatical constructions. So, that's the plan for today's class. And, in addition, I should point out that in this video you will learn a lot of vocabulary connected with health. So, you will enlarge your vocabulary. Anyway, that's it. I mean the plan. And let's get down to business and read the story itself. Okay. Mark Twain, How to Cure a Cold. It is a good thing, perhaps, to write for the amusement of the public, but it is a high, but it is a far higher and nobler thing to write for their instruction, their profit, their actual benefit. It is the only object of this article. If it helps to restore the health of one sufferer among my race, to bring back to his dead heart again the quick, generous impulses of other days, I shall be rewarded for my work. Having led a pure and blameless life I believe that no man who knows me will reject the suggestions I'm about to make, out of fear that I'm trying to deceive him. Let the public do itself the honor to read my experience in curing a cold and then follow in my footsteps. When the White House was burned in Virginia, I lost my home, my happiness my constitution, and my trunk. Let me just quickly check if anything goes well. Okay, I believe it is. Let's continue. The loss of the two first named articles was a matter of no great consequence since a home without a mother or a sister or a distant young female relative in it, who remind you that there are those who think about you and care for you, is easily obtained. And I did not care about the loss of my happiness. I was not a poet, and it could not be possible that melancholy would stay with me long. But to lose a good constitution and a better trunk was seri were serious misfortunes. On the day of the fire, my constitution succumbed to a severe cold. The first time I began to sneeze, a friend told me to go and bathe my feet in hot water and go to bed. I did so. Shortly afterward, Another friend advised me to get up and take a cold shower bath. I did that also. <clears throat> Within the hour, another friend told me that I had to feed a cold and starve a fever. I, I had both. I decided to fill myself up for the cold and then let the fever starve a while. <clears throat> Sorry. I ate pretty heartily, 
once I went to a stranger who had just opened his restaurant that morning. He waited near me in respectful silence until I had finished feeding my coat, when he asked if the people in Virginia were much afflicted with colds. I told him I thought they were. He then went out and took in his sign. I started down toward the office and on the way met another friend who told me that a quart of salt water taken warm would cure a cold in no time. I hardly had room for it, but I tried it anyway. The result was surprising. I must have vomited three quarters of an hour. I believe I threw up my immortal soul. I believe warm salt water may be a good enough remedy, but I think it is too severe. If I had another cold and there was no way out but to take either an earthquake, earth, sorry, and there was no way out but to take either an earthquake or a quart of warm salt water, I would be glad to choose the earthquake. After the storm in my, after the storm in my stomach, I went back to handkerchiefs, as had been my custom in the early stages of my cold, until I came across a lady who said she had lived in a part of the country where doctors were scarce and had from necessity learned to treat simple family complaints. I knew she must have had much experience, for she seemed to be 150 years old. She mixed a variety of drugs and instructed me to take a wine glass full of it every 15 minutes. I never took but one dose. That was enough. Under its, under its influence, my brain showed miracles of meanness, but my hands were too weak to execute them. Like most other people, I often feel mean and act so, but until I took that medicine, I had never felt proud of it. At the end of two days, I was ready to go to curing again. I took a few more remedies and finally drove my cold from my head to my lungs. I got to coughing and my voice fell below zero. I spoke in a thundering bass two octaves below my natural tone. My case grew more and more serious every day. Plain gin was recommended. I took it. Then gin and molasses. I took that also. Then gin and onions. I added the onions and took all three. I detected no particular result, however, except that I had acquired a breath like a buzzard's. Sorry, I need to read it in a different intonation. I detected no particular result, however, except that I had acquired a breath like a buzzard's. I understood I had to travel for my health. I went to Lake Bigler with my comrade reporter, Adair Wilson. My friend took all his baggage with him, consisting of two excellent silk handkerchiefs and his grandmother. I had my regular gin and onions along. We sailed and hunted and fished and danced all day, and I treated my cough all night. But my disease continued to grow worse. A sheet bath was recommended. I had never refused a remedy yet, and it seemed poor policy to start then. It was done at midnight, 
and the weather was very frosty. My breast and my back were bared, and a sheet, there appeared to be a thousand yards of it, soaked in ice water was put all around me. When the chill rag touches one's warm flesh, it makes him feel sudden violence and gasp for breath, just as men do in the death agony. It stopped the beating of my heart. I thought my time had come. Never take a sheet bath. Never. When the sheet bath failed to cure my cough, a lady friend recommended the application of a mustard plaster to my breast. I believe that would have cured me if it hadn't been for young Wilson. When I went to bed, I put my mustard plaster, which was an 18 inch square, where I could reach it when I was ready for it. But young Wilson got hungry at night and ate it up. I never saw anybody have such an appetite. I am confident that he would have eaten me if I had been healthy. After a week at Lake Bigler, I went to Steamboat Springs, and besides the steam baths, I took a lot of worst and besides the steam baths, I took a lot of the worst medicines ever created. They would have cured me, but I had to go back to Virginia, where in spite of the variety of new remedies I took every day, I managed to aggravate my disease. I finally went to San Francisco, and the first day I got here, one lady told me to drink a quart of whiskey every 24 hours. And a friend recommended precisely the same. Each advised me to take a quart. That makes half a gallon. I plan to do it or perish in the attempt. Now, with the kindest motives in the world, I offer for the consideration of patients the course of treatment I have lately gone through. Let them try it. If it doesn't cure them, it can't more than kill them. And that's the end of the story. I hope that you enjoyed it. It's, it's hilarious. Anyway, mm -hmm. I see that there are some people there. I'm glad. And by the way, I have completely forgot that I was going to include a donation link in the description box. I will do it a bit later, I guess. Or maybe right now, just give me a second, okay? Mm -hmm. Donation, donations. By the way, while you are waiting, you can read the questions and think how you can answer them. So now I'm going to include the link. I'm not sure where to put it. Ah, here. No, it's not here. Okay, I will put it in the chat then, I guess. <laughs> you can use it if you want to support my channel, support my work. Let's get back to our questions. So, there are a ton of them. Right now, if you watch the recording, you can simply pause the video and answer each and every question. You can go back and see some parts which will help you answer this question, this or that question. Uh, but if you watch this stream live, I will give you a couple of seconds to think. So I will read the questions quickly. Number one, what was the greatest loss for the author he suffered from the fire? Just think for a couple of seconds and I'll continue reading the questions. I will not answer the questions myself, myself because it will be boring. So if you do not understand how you should answer this or that question, write a comment 
and I will answer later. Question number two. What symptoms did the author experience? Enumerate them. What symptoms did the author experience? Number three. Which advice would you take if you had a cold? There were a lot of remedies suggested, some of them really crazy. So which advice would you take? Number four. Four. There's five, but there should be four. Okay, there are nine questions. Uh, but, well, number five. I can uh, make up number four. The question number four would be what ad mm -hmm. What advice would you give to someone who has a cold? Imagine that you are a doctor. Give your advice. That would be question number four. Five. Why did the restaurant owner take in his sign? So he decided to quit the business. He just took in his sign. So there are no, there is no restaurant there anymore. He doesn't want to do it. So why? Six. Oh, we have two sixes. Never mind. The first six. <laughs> what was the author doing at Lake Bigler? Why did he go there? And what was he doing there? Six point two. Why was the old lady reliable to give advice about health? There was one old lady there. Why was she reliable to give advice about health? Try to remember, or if you watch the recording, you can go back and find the answer, formulate the answer. Always try to formulate the answer with whole sentences, not just one word or two whole long sentences so that you would practice formulating your ideas in English. 7. Do you think it's a good idea to travel for your health? Especially now, during this crazy COVID pandemic. Well... So, do you think it's a good idea to travel for your health? It's dubious, I would say. But, well, I'm interested in your answers. You can answer in the chat box or uh, in, a, in the comment section. Let's continue. Eight. How did applying a sheet bath affect the author's body? So, what happened to his body when he applied a sheet bath? was crazy. The next question, number nine. Was it Mark Twain himself who was ill? What do you think, in your opinion? Was it Mark Twain? Or did he write about somebody else? Or was it just an imagined situation? And ten. What was the most ridiculous advice you heard about curing a cold? The most ridiculous advice. Something just the stupidest thing ever. What was it? That's it about the questions. Now I'll take a look at the comments if there are any. <clears throat> just give me a second. Hi everyone, I, I'm really glad that you are joining and welcome. I'm also very glad to see you. So, we continue and move on to our third stage. Just give me a sec to drink some water. My voice is killing me today. I must have caught a cold myself. No, I haven't. It's just, I don't know. It's morning here. 
Let's take a look at some vocabulary and interesting grammatical constructions. The first one, I'm about to make. So, the suggestion I'm about to make. You can use this phrase, I'm about to do something, when you say that you are going to do something very soon. So, you will do it in just a second. So, you are going to do something. I'm about to go drink a glass of wine because I'm too terrified of live streaming. <clears throat> I'm about to stand up and run away. Kidding. I'm not going anywhere. So, let's continue. I'm about to or somebody else can be about to do something. The second phrase, follow in my footsteps. So, to follow in somebody's footsteps means <clears throat> to do something the same way they did. So, to repeat their experience. This phrase is often used when you talk about parents and children. So, children follow in their parents' footsteps. I didn't follow in my parents' footsteps. My mom is an accountant and my father is a programmer. So, well, the next one, constitution. Here we are not talking about the document, but about somebody's health. Let's move on. A matter of no great consequence. This is a very good formal expression, which you can squeeze in your documents, your letters, your conversation with your boss, if your relationship is very formal. Well, it's very advanced and formal, official. A matter of no great consequence. It means that something is not going to cause any big problems. So, it's not a big deal, in other words, if you communicate with your boss in a colloquial way. It's not a big deal. It's a matter of no great consequence. That would be formal. Serious misfortunes. This is the opposite, actually. And this phrase is also quite formal. So, serious misfortunes means that these are serious problems. So, the next phrase in grey, because it is connected with health, a severe cold. There's nothing very special about it, it's just you can use this adjective severe with the word cold. A severe cold. When you talk about some illness, it can be severe, really serious. A severe cold. To bathe my feet in hot water. This is one of the tips somebody gave to the author. Bathe my feet in hot water. So, you can do it if you are ill. I'm not sure that it's going to help. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Fill myself up. This is a phrasal verb which means to eat a lot. So, you eat a lot and you're not hungry anymore. You fill yourself up. Like you fill your stomach up that is completely full. The next expression, to cure a cold in no time. To cure a cold, this is a set expression. Uh, when you cure a cold, you don't have it anymore. And in no time, this is a good phrase, it means that during a very short period of time, so very quickly, in no time, very quickly, like, okay, I can't, I can't, oh, there it is. Okay, the next one. I hardly had room for it. Room, like space, where? In my stomach. It means that I didn't have room in my stomach for something to eat or to drink. I hardly had room for it, like I didn't want to eat it, I didn't want to drink it, I was full. The next one, I must have vomited. Here I want to focus on the construction, must have vomited. There's the modal verb must, which doesn't have anything to do with obligation here, but it is used to say that you are 100% 
sure about something. So I must have vomited means that I'm 100% sure that I vomited three quarters of an hour. So we use must plus a perfect infinitive to talk about the past. And we mean that we are sure that something happened in the past. Must have vomited, must have uh, slept, must have run, and so on. The next one is throw up. It is throw up, which means the same as to vomit. It's a phrasal verb which can be used in the, within this topic, health, to throw up. Then, there was no way out but to take something, to do something. It means that there were no other options. So it's a good expression. And if you are not an English speaking guy or girl, you will probably not formulate your idea like this. And this is how you should do it. Well, you can do it. There was no other opportunity or there was no way out, but to do something. So the only option was to do something. I came across a lady. Another phrasal verb, I met a lady. Must have had much experience. Uh, so once again, we talk about something, we are sure about it, and it's connected with the past, must have had. So I'm sure she had much experience. To Lake Bigler, here I wanted to point out that we do not use an article here, the, the, we don't say the, we say to Lake Bigler, that's it. With lakes, it's usually like that. Let's move on. Treated my cough. It's also just a set expression. If you treat your cough, you make it go away. You do something so that you would stop coughing. Thought my time had come. I thought my time had come. A set expression which means I thought I'm about to die. Once again, I use the phrase to be about to do something, so I'm going to die. So I thought my time had come. My time to die. The next one. Failed to cure my cough. So some remedies, some medicines can fail to cure your cough your sneezing, your fever, and so on. But just a set expression so that you could enlarge your vocabulary connected with the topic health. The next one, if it had not been for young Wilson, something would happen. So it means that Wilson was the reason why something didn't happen. So if it had not been for young Wilson. You can use this phrase uh, in past simple as well and say, if it wasn't for my friend, I would go to the cinema tonight. So he forgot to buy the tickets. If it wasn't for my friend, I would go to the cinema tonight, but I'm not going to. So, if it wasn't for somebody or something, it means that something or somebody caused you not to do something. The next expression, would have eaten. Here, uh -huh, this is a conditional sentence. He would have eaten me if I had been healthy. Here we have an unreal situation in the past. We use would plus perfect infinitive. He would have eaten. So what he would do, in, what he would have done in the past. And if I had been healthy. In the if clause, we have past perfect. And here we talk about an unreal situation in the past. In spite of the variety, uh, this one, is, uh, hmm, how could I explain it to you? Um, so this phrase, in spite of something, shows that 
um, some fact is quite surprising, even though there was another fact. So there are two facts mentioned usually. The fact which it goes after in spite of shows why the second fact is surprising. So here, in spite of the variety of new remedies I took every day, so the fact that I took a lot of remedies makes it surprising that I managed to aggravate my disease. So the second fact is surprising and it's used with the help of this phrase, in spite of. You can also say despite the variety of new remedies or you can use although but you need to uh, create not a noun, you need to have a verb form here. For example, you should say, uh, although there were a lot of remedies I took every day, or something like that, or although I took a lot of remedies every day, I managed, then you can use although, there should be a clause. But if you use the phrase in spite of or despite, there should be a noun following this phrase. Okay, moving on. Offer for the consideration of patients the course of treatment. This is another very beautiful formal expression you can use in your business communications or something like that. So it's very formal, very official and advanced. So you offer for the consideration of somebody something. You offer something for the consideration of somebody. Offer for the consideration of patients, the course of treatment. Here, we, the course of treatment goes at the end of the phrase because it's long, the course of treatment. If there was just one word, like I offer this document for the consideration of my colleagues, you can put the object after the verb offer. But if the object is too long, it usually goes somewhere down the road. So you offer something for somebody to consider, to take a close look at. Offer for the consideration of somebody. Offer something for the consideration of somebody. Okay, and that's it. Now, there's a little bonus for you. I found an article which was previously printed about Mark Twain and his story, How to Cure a Cold. Let's read it together. There are some interesting expressions here as well. So let's take a closer look. The best medicine. It was published in the Paris Review. If you are not sick, you soon will be. And all the hand sanitizer in the world won't save you. Everyone is a potential foe. No one wants to admit it. This morning on the subway, everyone was coughing and sneezing with varying degrees of discretion. The only people who seemed at all comfortable were two Japanese tourists wearing paper surgical masks. Well, maybe also the old man with a roll of toilet paper hanging around his neck on a loop of string. I envied all of them. All you can do is read Mark Twain. He wrote How to Cure a Cold for the Golden Era shortly after arriving in San Francisco in September 1863. Twain may never have actually said the famous thing about a San Francisco summer being the coldest winter he had known, he had ever known, but the Bay Area fog was presumably enough to, aggrava to aggravate a lingering head cold. I will read it again. But the Bay Area fog was presumably enough to aggravate a lingering head cold. Well, that or a 19th century cross-country train ride. According to a series of humorous letters to the editor, 
to the editor, Twain sent in to the coal and the enterprise around this period, he'd had the cold and an ensuing bout of bronchitis for at least a month when he wrote this piece chronicling various home remedies. While the cures Twain details may sound highly dubious, take a look in your own medicine cabinet. At this time of year, most of us have enough tinctures, neti pots, supplements, and bombs to furnish a small-time medicine show. Since I sp uh, just spent the better part of a month's rent on some cold-pressed concoction containing echinacea, green tea, and an unpleasant note of oregano, I'll withhold my own judgments. Okay, before we go to the question, what is in your medicine cabinet, um, I would like to ask you again, was it Mark Twain who was actually ill, who had a cold? After reading this article, you can answer and be 100% sure. So, let's take a look at some phrases and then return to the question. Hand sanitizer. Well, everybody knows that one to sanitize your hands. Paper surgical masks. Everybody should wear those now. I do. Hope you do too. The next one. May never have actually said. Another interesting grammatical construction, but not with m must, with may. So the same goes about may. We can use may, the modal verb may, plus a perfect infinitive, here have said. When we talk about the past, when we are not quite sure that something happened. So we are not sure, like 50-50, so-so. And a lingering head cold. You can say a lingering cold when there's a disease which sticks to you and doesn't go away. You can't get rid of it. So you have it for quite a long time. So a lingering cold. Lingering. A bout of bronchitis. This is a said expression you can use when somebody has bronchitis. Then medicine cabinet, the cabinet where you have all those neti pots, tinctures, remedies, and so on. So what is in your medicine cabinet? Tell me, are there many things? I should say, I should say that my medicine cabinet is this big, I guess. <laughs> And there are quite many things, but I almost never use anything. So I try to make my body work to fight off a cold or the flu or the coronavirus. Uh, well, tell me about your experience. How you have fought off a cold, the COVID-19, something else. So improve your vocabulary, active vocabulary connected with health. It's a good time. We have learned a new, sorry, I'm just, we have learned a lot of new expressions here today connected with health and you can use them. You can introduce them into your active vocabulary. Now let me take a quick a sneak peek at the chat if there are any questions. Mm -hmm. So no questions, then I'm going to stop here. I will refresh my phone, probably there are some questions still. No, nothing. I hope that some people at least watched this stream and it was useful for you. Let's go back and change the scene so that you will see me. I'm blue in the face. <laughs> okay, so 
Hope that you enjoyed watching this class and it was useful for you. You enlarged your active vocabulary, you came across some interesting grammatical constructions. If you have questions, write a comment. Also, you can support my work, my channel and follow the link in the description box. What else? I really enjoy working with you. I hope that during my next stream there will be more participants and we will have a lot of fun. Anyway, that's it for today. Hope to see you next time and write your own ideas about what I should do during my next live stream for you. What would you like to do? Do you want me to do a test together? Probably SAT or IELTS or any other test. Would you like me to read some more stories? What levels do you want me to address? So make sure to give me some feedback. But that's it. I really enjoyed our work today and I hope to see you 